Anyone from Yonkers here? Oh yes, thank you, my Yonkers folks, thank you. But the reason I'm here, uh, one is you have great state legislators who represent you throughout West Virginia, and I want to give you a lot of them. background, so I'm very fortunate to be involved with organizing, and that's my approach, so I appreciate being invited here. Uh, secondly, my chief of staff, uh, Rachel Estroff, was among the founders of Westchester for Change, and she happens to be Joe's wife, so we have a little connection. <laughs> it's all in the family, which is good. And the third thing I think, and my Yonkers people will understand this very well, Yonkers is probably a good microcosm of some of the challenges we face in organizing. Because, for example, in my uh, district, I represent only Yonkers, but not all of Yonkers. I represent the whole east side of Yonkers. I have the election districts with the highest Trump voter participation uh, in the county. Uh, they voted for Shelley Mayer and Donald Trump. So, <laughs> just to show you, though, that, you know, there are complications we have to face as organizers and, and involved in this resistance to the Trump world, which means that some of our neighbors voted for Donald Trump and find aspects of him, his uh, approach appealing, and we, we need to deal and acknowledge that, and I think that's part of the conversation. But my um, sort of nitty-gritty conversation has three parts. One, a little bit uh, at the very basic level, introduction to how the state and local government works in terms of elected officials. Two, why there is a local response that is appropriate to some of the things that the Trump administration either has done or will do, and how we can impact that and why it's relevant. Um, just to say that the indivisible movement, we talked about it earlier, and I'm involved in the one in Congressman Engel's district, which is not opposing any of our great Democratic Congress members, but is to help support them to be as aggressive and uh, strong in their responsiveness to this administration. And to that end, Indivisible New York 16, if you're represented by Congressman Engel, we are having a town hall next Sunday, March 5th at 1230. He's going to be there at the College of Mount uh, St. Vincent on the line between the Bronx and Yonkers. I'm happy to answer. But my point is, Indivisible, which has done an extraordinary job in Westchester and throughout the country in capturing this dynamic, is helping us organize to support our Democratic Congress members and to push our Republican Congress members. So there's a role for both. Uh, and the third thing I want to talk about is something that people ask me all the time. What matters to you local people, you local politicians? You, you know, we don't know whether to call your office. Does anybody care? No one answers the phone. We don't know whether to email you. We don't believe anyone reads the emails. We don't know whether to do a petition. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what I believe matters as someone who would not only uh, now elected, but for many, many years was staff, and I was the counsel to the Senate Democrats uh, during four very rocky years in Albany, so I have something to say about that. So, state and local government, so just basics, people probably know, but forgive me if, if you already know. There's 150 members of the New York State Assembly, the vast majority are Democrats, we really control the chamber. Nothing against our Republican colleagues, we actually have a very collegial relationship, but they cannot get stuff done, policy stuff. We, the Democrats in the Assembly, under the leadership of Carl Hastie, who's our speaker, there's 107 of us in a body of 150, so we, we, we can always pass bills without the Republicans. Uh, we determine our agenda, and we have a very strong, progressive agenda, even though we're a very diverse group. We go from Watertown and the Canadian uh, border to obviously all the five boroughs. And we continue to build with progressive Democrats like we have. David Buckwell took out an incumbent here in White Plains, Amy Paulin, uh, Sandy Galef, Tom Abenanti, and then Gary Pretlow, who's the head of the Westchester delegation. Just so you know, the head of the Westchester delegation for the New York State Legislature is Gary Pretlow, who represents Yonkers and Mount Vernon. So that's the New York State Assembly. New York State Senate, and many of you may know this, particularly if you're represented by Senator Stuart Cousins, the peculiar configuration of the New York State Senate, but it's relevant to what we're trying to do in Albany. Okay, there are 63 members that can be elected right now, there's a vacancy. 63 members of the New York State Senate. There are 
Um, you need 32 to have a majority. There are 31 Republicans and one Democrat who caucuses with the Republicans. So that gets them to 32. 31 plus the one. I'll answer one minute. There are a numerical majority of Democrats. There are, right now, because Senator Perkins just won for the city council and the seat is vacant, 22 Democrats and eight members of the Independent Democratic Conference. That is, so, so Senator Klein um, has a conference of eight people, eight democratically elected senators. They do not conference with the Republicans, but they co-lead and they formed a working majority. So the majority is controlled by uh, the Senate Republicans and the Senate IDC, Independent Democratic Conference. Therefore, although there's a numerical majority of Democrats, traditional Democrats who are led by Senator Stewart Cousins, they are not in the majority. And as you just heard at the federal level, in the minority, and I spent two years as counsel to the minority and other years in the minority in the Senate, it really needs you do not have a seat at the table. You do not decide what bills are on the agenda. You know when, when Joe gave the example of the bills that go and die in committee? That's basically almost all traditional Democratic bills in the Senate. Until we change that and get the Democrats, one way or another, to be the leaders in the Senate, we have a challenge getting progressive things that we do in the Assembly done in the Senate, even with the Democratic governor, we are stuck. So we need to fix that. And that's one of the things that I think organizing is going on about. Advocacy, people are waking up. Wait a minute. We thought we had this in New York State. We have all these progressive people. We have a numerical majority. What the heck? We can't get Roe v. Wade codified in the New York State law. We can't because they will not bring that bill to the floor in the New York State Senate. So, just that is a challenge for us, and, and everybody should understand it. Westchester County Legislature, unfortunately, has a similar construct. And that's what, the other reason why local politics really matters. So, Westchester County Legislature, there are 17 members. What do they deal with? County parks, the county prison, uh, social services, child care subsidy, incredibly important. Only 14% of people were eligible or getting it, but for low-income parents, this is an offset of the cost of child care. And for providers of child care in low-income communities like ours, this is the source of keeping their child care afloat. They're getting this subsidy. So these issues of child care, social services, Medicaid, eligibility, uh, public assistance, those are some of the county issues. And you heard about the gun show. Uh, <coughs> Playland, good example, that's part of the county park system. So in the airport, the airport, there's lots of issues that people care about decided by the county, but here's the challenge, okay? 17 members, seven Republicans, nine Democrats. But two Democrats, uh, Virginia Perez from Yonkers and Kaplowitz, uh, allied with the Republicans form a working majority. So you have a working majority on the county board of legislators, sort of like the New York State Senate, which notwithstanding a numerical majority of Democrats, uh, poses a problem to doing some of the things. Now credit on the bill that we talked about earlier, uh, on the gun bill, getting it through, and that was tremendous advocacy, and it got vetoed, but I don't think there were the votes to override the veto because of this. They're working on it. Okay, we keep working. Uh, We'll talk about that in a minute. But just so you understand, that is one of the challenges with both the New York State Senate and the County Board of Legislators. I just want to mention one thing that I think is relevant to this whole focus on local politics, which I am very committed to. We did an analysis in the city of Yonkers where there's a two to one Democratic enrollment advantage, and yet the city council is controlled by Republicans. In off year elections, non presidential elections, Registered Democrats, 25% vote. Registered Republicans, 75% vote. So it isn't just registration. I'm very involved, and many people I'm sure are involved in registration campaigns, and they're very important. But we have to persuade people that it matters how you vote in these off-year elections about what's actually happening in your community. And we haven't done a good enough job on that. And I believe we have a real responsibility to convince people 
yet it matters how you vote for your town board, your school board, and your water board, and your city council, and all these local races. Because at the end of the day, two things. One, they make policy that impacts your lives. And two, to the point that Congresswoman Lowy made earlier, we need a pipeline. We need a bench of new people to come up and replace some of us people who are over 60. You know, next group's time to come up who have been through and been beaten up a few times. Uh, and we need to bring these new people in. And frankly, we need to have a more diverse group of people that represent the fact that Westchester is a diverse county. We need to do better at that. So just uh, in terms of registration is not alone. Uh, some of the issues I want to talk about where I think people say to me now, well, there's nothing, local politics doesn't really matter because it's all about Congress and the Senate and getting them to change the president's executive orders, which we totally agree. But there are things that we can do and we should do, and some of which we have done in the state of New York to deal with some of these issues. On the issue of the immigration, uh, and at the time of the ban, before the Ninth Circuit had ruled, the New York State Democratic Assembly passed, they call it a sanctuary state, but it really isn't. It's a limitation on the use of state resources to facilitate uh, the ICE activities that the President directed. So it said, for example, that our state police, our state prisons, our state port authority, these cannot be tools in the president's arsenal. That's something very specific we did. We had a robust debate, and not every Democrat voted for it, but we passed it. Can we get it on the Senate floor to be considered? No, we cannot under the current configuration. We cannot. The governor has done some things on his own by executive order and otherwise to try to address this issue in New York, and he's been a very strong champion. But there are things we need to do legislatively. On Roe v. Wade, where we are really at risk with the president's appointment to the uh, Supreme Court of having bad case law, we need to change New York law, the actual statute, so it codifies the protection of Roe v. Wade and it puts it into the public health law. Currently, the words about abortion are in the penal law, which is the criminal law. They don't belong there. They're, they're out of date. They're wrong. They are not currently used. But we don't want them there. We want the law to reflect what the Supreme Court said. We have passed in the Assembly the so-called 10th point of the Women's Equality Agenda, which is the codification, the putting into the statute the words of Roe v. Wade. We passed it again this year. Again, we cannot get it on the floor of the Senate until we have a change in the leadership of who decides what comes to the floor. Uh, I got, and I'm going to talk about it in terms of emails and things, on the issue of uh, transgender bathroom usage. The governor, you may have seen, wrote a very strong letter to the Commissioner of Education saying New York is not going to abide by what Trump said and we are going to go with New York law which prohibits uh, gender discrimination and applies in the educational context and that is going to be the way it's going to be in New York and credit to him for standing up. But there are things we have to do in response and we have to prepare ourselves. One thing we're very worried about is sort of the punishment of New York State for anything that happens for the sanctuary city of the cities of New York and other cities that have adopted it. What if the amount of money that New York gets from the federal government is, is reduced in the middle of the year? We're right now debating the budget. The budget is due by March 31st, the state budget. What if, uh, because of the sanctuary city or some other change in Medicaid and it's block granted and they reduce the amount we get or some other education change, which is possible? The governor is saying in his budget proposal, if we lose money from the federal government in the course of our state budget year, he wants to be able to reallocate as he sees fit, which is an understandable position. Uh, we as legislators disagree. We think that. We should have a seat at the table and battle it out again about how to make the fairest reallocation. But we have to be prepared, particularly on Medicaid, that if they block grant Medicaid, which is to say, instead of saying you get based on the number of people you have on Medicaid eligible, we're going to give you New York this much money and Ohio this much money, and you sort of do with it what you will to cover who you will. We know New York will do a fairly good job given our history. But you can be sure that Alabama, Tennessee, South Carolina, there are people who are going to not get health care that are 
currently eligible for Medicaid. So we have to be prepared for changes in Medicaid. Again, in the Assembly, we passed a single-payer bill. It's, I used to think, why are we spending all our time on this? That was before Trump got elected. Now I'm like, good thing we keep there spending our time. There are cards in the back for people to sign for that bill from the Senate. Good. So if they, you see that card, you sign it with your name and it will get to your senator. Right? Okay. So um, I'm, the I, I'm, I'm just going to uh, talk now about sort of what works in contacting your local officials. And um, I would say all of the assembly members and senators that represent Westchester are extremely receptive. Uh, really, we have a very, very good group and we work together. We have different styles and we have different approaches and that's the way it goes. Uh, so I'm going to tell you my approach about what counts. And my sister is here and she was asking me earlier, you know, people get told, you know, you should email, you should send a letter, call your office, blah, blah, blah. One, I count emails. I count emails. If I get 10 emails about a subject, I note it and I ask my staff to note it. I read my own assembly emails. Uh, however, I would say this. You know how uh, many groups now use this sort of uh, pre-packaged email and you just enter your zip code they send it to you? That is less powerful than a two-sentence email from you personally. So me, Shelly Mayer, writing to you know, David Buckwell, David, I want you to do this and this. Is, I believe, more powerful than the manufactured one. But I'm not against them. They do count. They count. And don't let people say that it doesn't matter what you do about this. It, it absolutely does because of the point Joe made. The biggest fear of politicians is not being elected. So if too many people are writing you about something and you're on the other side, you have to revisit it and either defend your position or prepared to moderate your position or meet with them and hear them out. But if you get a large number on an issue, you pay attention. So emails do matter. Calls, I think, are very valuable. There are bills that come before the state legislature. And sometimes they, uh, people get energized right before we have to vote. And I, for example, frequently uh, on mass on Sunday in my district, a priest will say to the parishioners, but there's a number of bills they don't like, you call my office the next day and tell me to vote no. And I would get 30 calls coming out of one parish or another where people were told to vote no or vote yes on a bill. That matters to me. Those are people who care enough to call my office. They may or may not have supported me. It has nothing to do with that, and I do not care about them. My view, if 10 people bother to call me, either I should defend my position, rethink my position, or have a meeting and see what their point is so that I'm uh, responsive. But calls do matter. Social media is very important. The one thing I would say is, generally speaking, it's most important that you communicate with the person in whose district you live. I don't care a lot about anybody from White Plains or anyone. Anyway, love you all. But unless you live in the 90th Assembly District, your communication means less to me. I have a complicated district, like most of my colleagues. It's hard enough to manage the 137,000 people that we represent, and that's what we're focused on. So go to the people that represent you more than the congressman in Ohio, or the senator who's from a different district. However, with social media, you can target people who are not in your district and put pressure on them. That happened with the raise the age issue. Uh, raise the age, that is changing the age of criminal responsibility, which again the Assembly has passed, the Senate has not yet passed, and the Governor has his own view. We all got tweeted by people from around the country about our support of raise the age. I don't know where that came from, but I thought it was an effective, non-district specific tool. So social media I think can work, although generally I say <coughs> I'm not the biggest fan of letters. I, it's a very nice idea, and occasionally we get great letters, but unless you have a big enough staff to really respond individually, then you feel like, I should, a person took the time to write, I should either call or see them, have a meeting with them, and sometimes you, you just get left out because we don't have enough staff for time to do that. I think you're better off to email. Postcards are fine, good, love postcards. Yeah, we count them, very important. I'm not a fan of faxes. I tell some of the unions in fax, don't send faxes unless they have the person's email. 
Um, we want to be able to communicate back. It's difficult with a letter. We, we just did a letter to 60 people in our district who wrote us against um, Betsy DeVos. I signed a letter against Betsy DeVos. Now she's the Secretary of Education. I don't have any other way to get back to you and say, yes, I actually agree with you and I did something that you think probably think is good and I want you to know. So we wrote them back a letter. But that's a challenge for us with our assembly offices where we have modest Yeah, I'll get to you one. Just one last thing I want to say about that. Um, I mentioned about social media. There was, there was one thing. Oh, one, one example I want to give this week that something happened with the, um, a, a man in my district wrote me a personal email, which I read, very upset about the transgender issue and, and Trump's policy. He had his phone number. I called him. And I said, I agree with you. And here's what the governor has done. I emailed him the governor's letter. And, you know, activists like yourself want to feel like someone is paying attention. You're not always going to get a call back. You're not always going to get a response. Don't hold, honestly, be honest. You know, we are not going to be perfect in getting back to everyone. There are a lot of things that fall through the cracks. I'd be the first to admit it. But if we can pull you back and you put your phone number, that's meaningful to you and it's meaningful to us because we talk to somebody who really is passionate enough to write us. So I, I appreciate it people put their phone numbers in their emails. Yes? Both for, uh, at the state level and at the uh, congressional level, we make our calls to the, our, the local district office or to the uh, all of the uh, uh, marshals. Well, I think it's, um, I would say it's not such a big deal where you, because uh, in my office, for example, I only have an intern in Albany. I mean, she answers the phone very well and she'll do the best she can. She'll send it down to the office. So in the legislature, I don't think it's such a big deal which office you call. In Congress, I think it's where you can get through. People are having trouble getting through to our Congress members. And I have called Senator Schumer's office and I spoke to uh, his New York director and I said, people are frustrated. And they said, we can't help it. We are just being completely bombarded. We do not have, we are at our capacity of phone usage. So I think with them, anywhere you can get through. People have called the Peekskill office of Senator Schumer because they have been able to get through. And um, I'm, I'm sure whatever office you can get to, I don't think it matters that much. Thank you. Yes? Um, whether it's emails or um, letters or postcards, how, is it more effective to just have a single thing that you're talking to about or maybe a bullet list of, of things? Um, is it best to keep one thing? I guess is what I'm saying. Well, I think they might go repeat it. Yeah, the question was in, in your communicating with an elected official, should you do like one issue at a time, or like a bullet. Look, I think we're talking about a whole different bullet here in this post-Trump world. And we're going to get postcards from people are going to say, look, do everything you can in New York State to stand up against the Trump thing, and here's five things I care about. I think that's fine. We, we're going to change the rules, because this is a whole different world of wax. And that's why I also say, you know, credit to my colleagues in the legislature who have been very brave about doing things that not in every district, and including mine, you know, can you defend, you know, can you be free from attack about these things? We're not in regular times. We're not in regular times. We've got to do the regular things.